You know what? I got no statements after 18 years. <laughs> you know, I got, I got no statements. Uh, fire away, fire away. Mike, you talked last time we saw you a couple weeks ago about some of the things, some of the numbers you wanted to see in practice. To date, what do you what do you see that you like? What you, what you need work on? How, how's everything gone so far? You know, we've shot it from three better than I thought we would have after. 11 practices. Um, now, you know, again, still that's kind of a small sample size. So we'll see. Um, you know, I, I love what we're doing defensively. We're getting some hands. We're, we, we've got a team that gets deflections. When you add Bonzi, who's already always been a guy who gets deflections with that wingspan. And then you have Rex and TJ on, out there who are all over the place defensively and cover a lot of ground. You know, we're, we're getting some hands-on stuff, and I think I mentioned it uh, a couple weeks ago or a week ago when we talked, that, you, you know, you may be able to get some turnovers and some easy buckets off turnovers, which is uh, a little new for us. Um, you know, the veteran group that has been starting in the white shirts and will start tomorrow night, um, they, they really know how to play. They know our system. They, 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 I've been really happy with how they've played on both ends and how they communicate. With Bonzi, or, or will talk with Bonzi as far as all the attention that he's yeah. gotten, that he does, that, that he will get, and and not be the guy that may be the the ACC Player of the Year, but be the guy that that his first three years to, to get him to this point. It was funny because I think the first five days of practice, he was feeling it. He he wasn't very good. Um, he may have shot thirty percent from the floor the first five days of practice. Uh, what was great, and I reminded him and the team, is he did other things, but he was frustrated because he couldn't buy a bucket. Now, since then, and I told him, you know, can you smile a little bit? Can you enjoy this journey? Uh, I said, you know, you've always been the underdog. And for the first time, you're not the underdog. You're a player of the year candidate. You're talked about. But you still got to play like that. You got to get into that frame of mind. I think the last week, you know, he's been in a great rhythm and enjoying a little bit more. But I think that's a process. He and I spending time together because there's going to be times when he's feeling the weight of the world. There's going to be times when he's going to be double teamed for 30 minutes. And can he have the poise to keep kicking it out? get to the offensive board to get some putbacks that way, but to still defend and rebound. What have you seen from John Mooney and Elijah Burns that, that maybe elevate them closer to the rotation? Yeah, excited about both of them. I, I, I really am. They've made huge strides. Um, you know, right now I'd say Elijah Burns is our sixth man with what he's given us after 10-11 um, practices. But then yesterday Johnny was fabulous. We're going to need both those guys. They're our future uh, after this year as well, and I'm very mindful of that, you know, when we lose those three senior big guys. Uh, but Elijah is easy to play with on both ends of the floor. He really understands who he is. He's rebounding on both ends at a huge clip. Um, one of the reasons we recruited him was we loved how he talked and communicated, and, and he's fabulous there, and we loved how he passed the ball and moved it and knew who he was. So that's why I think, you know, he's kind of emerged – as a six guy, but I mean, Johnny uh, also physically around the bucket and he can stretch the floor and make shots. In a game situation yesterday, he made a three uh, to beat the white shirts in a, in a game situation. So both those guys figure figure into our plans. Coach, you touched on three point shooting and you lost about 200 three point shots. Uh, TJ, uh, I would assume is one of those guys that has to step up and fill that gap. What has he done in the offseason to work on his shooting? Well, I think the best thing that he's done is got himself in even better shape, down 17 pounds. I think he's just an all-around more efficient guy and has better legs over the duration of playing, let's say, 30-some minutes because he's in better shape. And you need good legs if you're going to shoot a three-point shot. You know, I, I mentioned our three-point shooting, and I don't want to hang our hat on that completely because we're a little bit different with TJ and Rex because they drive it more. And they drive. And, and you know, you got to think of Matt. Matt Farrell is, is a shooter. And one of the things we've talked about through the first 10 days of practice is once he initiates the offense as the point guard, but he's not always going to be the point guard, but once he does initiate, if he's in that role, then he's, he's got to think like a two-man and a shooter and come back around. So we could have Rex drive and kick to TJ who drive, and now he's kicking to our point guard who needs to step up so I've been on Matt Farrell. When he turns down a shot, I've been very upset with him. Um, you know, I think he's, he's got to shoot that for us. So 
yes, we're going to have to make some to get respect, but I like how we drive it a little bit and get in there with those two guys. And you touched on Matt. You have a history here of players developing from very, very little roles to the time they're juniors and seniors. They're really prominent, like VJ last year. Yep. Um, Matt is a guy that has come from nowhere to team leader. Talk about your off-season program, your development, your player development program, yeah. and, and how critical that is. Well, we're really proud of that. You know, guys get better here. It's one of the things we really sell in recruiting, that you're going to get better here. If you hang in there with us, invest with us, um, I think it helps that we've recruited guys that are gym rats, that want to be in the gym and want to work on their game. Matt Farrell is a great example of that. Um, but, you know, I think for him, getting in the gym um, – being a quarterback, being more vocal, you know, having to lead. I think what's helped him this summer was he was a major voice now with Bonzi. Like, they had to take control of the team. And that um, succession plan that they have seen since they were freshmen with Connaughton and Grant and then to Jackson and, and, and August and then to Vastori and Beecham, there's a lot of responsibility with that next group of seniors to feel like, man, this is a big role when we lead. And I think it's made him a better all-round player because he's had to communicate more. I was always on him the first two years. He wouldn't say anything. And, you know, you can get away with a little bit of that if you're not the point guard. But if you're the point guard, you've got to talk. Uh, but I think right now he feels he's one of the best guards in the country. He is. Um, and he feels it's his team. Um, but it, it's always been neat, and he's the latest in the last line of guys I've always loved to see guys, you know, you know, we're, we're a throwback in that guys have great senior years here. You know, we love them have great senior years, and I think he's lined up to have one. My, what? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, what was TJ's process of dropping all of that weight? Well, you know, TJ at the end of his se uh, the, the AAU season before his senior year was heavy. He was out of shape. He went back home, and his two brothers, his older brothers, Sterling and Ashton, got all over him. And he lost about 15 before he came, uh, uh, you know, before he started his senior year. And he was in pretty good shape, not this good a shape, when he started his freshman year last year. And then it kind of tailed. And his minutes weren't, you know, he, you know it, it, the, the problem a lot of times when you get into January and February is you're not practicing as, practicing as long. So the guys that aren't playing a lot of minutes, they're not burning – a lot of stuff in practice, and then if they only play nine minutes in a game, and we do extra cardio and all that, but I think it got away from at the end of the year last year, and he just went back to that diet that he was on before. I give a lot of credit to his mother. Every time I talk to his mom, I said, I want you as my nutritionist, you know, because you got him lean and mean, and I think him and his mom, you know, got together, uh, you know, before he came back in the summer, and then certainly in August after summer school, and really went back to work. But there was a lesson plan there before. He's even leaner now. And I have a feeling he, you know, I have a feeling we can really keep it off him now because he's seeing the progress and he's also starting. And so he, he, he feels it's, uh, but it, you know, just his movement, his energy, his recovery time, you know, for, and for a young guy to do it, it's a lot of times it, it, it takes guys a little longer in their college career to really understand nutrition. Um, I give him a lot of credit, but I think he had a major peer pressure with those big brothers uh, all over him that summer. Colson and Farrell, obviously your leaders. Rex Fluger began to step into that role last year. Where is he? He will be a voice. There's no question. He will be a voice. He's, uh, you know, there's a confidence about him now. Um, he has great things to say. He has a great feel of our system. Um, he plays with a great edge and energy. I sent, you know, I look at him as a voice and, and in a leadership role. Um, and then when I think a year from now, I think, you know, we'll have a guy that is going to be extremely confident rotating up. He'll be the only senior, if you look ahead, to be in a voice. But he, he has got a say with this group, and he should. He did a great job last year of limiting his, his, the number of three-point shots. He was very efficient. How do you go forward with him? I'd like for him to, you know, I, I think for him the same thing. You know, I don't think all of a sudden now that he's a starter, he's got to shoot a whole lot more of them. We want him to shoot good three-point shots, take good ones. His When he does, if you look at his percentage, they were very solid. 
you know. And, and, but but he is a guy that can get it on the floor and drive it and get fouled, and he can drive it and make plays. And he's a great move without the ball guy. You know, I have always I've been trying to show DJ Harvey clips of him moving without the ball. He's a great cutter. He's a great passer. You know, he had that run of no turnovers, you know, uh, back early last season. So when it's good, step up and take it. But he doesn't need to become Vastoria all of a sudden as far as that percentage from the arc. He's a different player. And I think he gets that. He understands that. Where are Fluger and Gibbs in terms of finishing around the basket? Yeah, I, I think both of them, you know, have the ability to do that. They've got good strength. Um, you know, they could, you know, uh, TJ's always had great strength. Even though he's leaner, he's still strong around the bucket. There's something about I-95 guards. They can shoot layups in traffic, especially New Jersey guys, New York guys. Some of the best New York, New Jersey guards shoot layups over big dudes, and you go, how did he get that off? You know, I look back over 30 years of college coaching. He's yet another out of that mold. Fluger, because of his athletic ability and his bounce, is able to get up. He can finish with dunks. They, what they do do is they have the ability to get fouled in there, and they're great free throw shooters. So that's a huge weapon for us. You said a couple of weeks ago this was the first time in your 18 years that you are looking at more of a defensive identity as opposed to one of the premier offensive teams efficiency-wise every year. After 11 practices, do you still see that type of yeah. identity? Change? Yeah, and I, and I think, Lou, what, what motivates me there is how much our group wants to defend together. You know, it's not me selling it or demanding it. They know – that can be a strength of theirs, especially when you talk about those first five guys, those veteran guys. They've played a lot together. They talk. I've really been impressed with how Bonzi and Martin talk and switch big guy stuff and communicate back there. We know the three guys on the perimeter can move their feet and fly around, and, and they really do. So I think it's more it, – a lot of it has come from them of them taking ownership of themselves and be, saying over the summer, man, we can really be better on this end of the floor, and it has paid off. I think we've had more deflections through 10 practices than we've ever had. Guys getting their hands on stuff and, and coming up with stuff. So, you know, I want to continue to emphasize that. I mean, there's no question we're not going to get where we want to get without that good old offensive efficiency that has been our trademark. And I think we understand that, taking care of the ball, I think we're going to shoot a good clip from the free throw line again. I think that will still be a weapon. Can we play our defense without fouling? We've done a good job of not, you know, fouling and putting people on the line. Um, and then, what is our percentage? You know, one of the one of the one of the first uh, analytics that maybe I came up with, and before they've got all this math, which is still sometimes intimidating to me, even though I've gotten a lot better at digesting it, and I've got all these young assistants that filter it to me. Um, but one of the first analytics we came up with, we were always interested in, in a scouting situation, total field goals of our opponents, and what percentage of the total field goals are three-point attempts. In other words, how are they using the arc? For example, when John Beeline was at West Virginia, and maybe still to date, almost 50% of their shots were three-point shots. Um, we've been down anywhere from 36 to 44 through my career from there, you know. So you're, you're always looking to, to see where is that. I'm interested, you know, for us, we may be, maybe our three-point attempts are lower, you know, in total field goals than ever before. That doesn't mean we can't be efficient and we still can't score. Um, so I, that's an interesting dynamic that I'm – again, we've got 10 practices, and I haven't even looked at it yet overall. But, you know, another 10 practices, I'd like to look at overall, you know, how are we using the arc, especially, you know, those, those five starters. You talked about Elijah and John both kind of emerging in that maybe post roll or stretch four roll. Where are Jogo and uh, DJ as far as uh, yep. maybe the next in the line of pecking order? Well, I think we have to get DJ Harbury ready to play. You know, we, we there's too much there to work with. Um, you know, he's the, he's the lone rookie in there. But you know what? He through osmosis because he's a sharp kid, which happens a lot in our program. He's learned how to move without the ball. When you play with all veteran guys, and he's playing with all veterans. You know, you kind of learn how to play, and they do a great job, you know, helping him with that. 
Um, so the, the, the explosiveness, the ability to play in the mid-range area, uh, he can defend and sit in a stance. He rebounds for his size like a Connaughton rebounds. He can get up and rebound. We substitute and we become smaller, and he's that so-called stretch four. That's an interesting lineup that we played around with through the first 10 practices. Been very impressed with Nick. You know, Nick has had a heck of a burden starting in the practices in the summer. He's handling the ball, and he's not really a point guard. But he's kind of becoming a better guard because he has to handle the ball against Farrell, Gibbs, and Fluger with the blue team for most of practice. Uh, and, and so I think it's made him a better decision maker. He's been better with taking care of the ball. I think turning it over, as a lot of young guys with our in our program have to learn to be better with it, he's come great lengths there. He can shoot the basketball, and, you know, that's something that's interesting to me, that he can stretch the floor. But I think, you know, both of them, you know, look – are competing, and you're not afraid to put them in the game. You know, you're not afraid to put them in the game. Uh, so, uh, impressed with both of them. Uh, you know, again, with Nick, he's older now. He's been in our system a year. There's an athletic ability. You know, he has the ability when he drives it. He's athletic. He gets up around a bucket. He gets fouled. Um, so I, I think he's a great investment for us. And, again, having to run the blue team every day against some veteran perimeter guards is only going to get him better. He, just played point in high school. he played it a little bit with his high school. Oh, just a little bit. You know, he was more of a off-the-ball guy, which when I do get him to a white shirt, you know, then it's Matt and I maybe put maybe Rex or TJ go over to the blue team and handle the ball, and then he's off the ball some because I still want him to get reps with that. Right now, if you think about against our starters, your perimeter with the blue team is Harvey, him, and a lot of time it's either Matt Gregory or Liam, uh, a walk-on in the third perimeter spot, so he's got to be the ball handler. There's a lot on him to make decisions with the ball every day. Um, some days – the, the white shirts get to him, uh, but I'll say more often than not, he's been pretty darn good with the ball, and he's only getting better. Mike, uh, how important and, I guess, great it is for you guys to add that third exhibition game? Yeah, we're excited. You know, I think with a veteran team, you know, after three or four practices, a veteran team is really kind of looking at, Coach, uh, can we start playing? You know, we did your drills here for – let's go, man. Let's play. And, and, and you know what? They're right. So to sit on the same bench – tomorrow uh, and be able to substitute and put the uniforms on, uh, have a crowd. I think we'll have a good crowd in there. I I think it'll be great. Um, Love the fact that, you know, Holy Cross can come across the road. And, you know, our guys play with them a lot in the summer. They're over in our gym a lot, so we know their guys. Um, But I think it's just good to, you know, today we'll go through a scouting report and a walkthrough. Tomorrow we'll have a shooter. You know, we'll go through the routine that is game day. And I like that we can do it early. Certainly the the benefit of uh, hurricane relief and where the money is going. If you look around the country, um, you know, it's the NCAA has been getting banged around a little bit lately. But I thought it was really good because we brought this up in our board of directors meeting with the NABC in August. And they turned it around quick. So let's give them a little bit of credit. Uh, they've been smoked a little bit lately. Uh, you know, they got a waiver for all of us so we can play some games to benefit a good cause. Coach, 18 years, uh, Rod Belanis has been with you all of yep. those. Talk about his evolution within the program and where he is today, how critical he is. You know, one of the great things about him, I, I think he's really a gifted coach and he's ready to be a head coach. Um, and, and I think he'll have some great opportunities uh, this spring. But, you know, he's got unbelievable institutional memory. You know, he, he's got a photographic memory, and he'll remember plays uh, from back in the day, drills we did. Um, what I've been really excited about is we lost two really gifted assistants in Inglesby and Solomon, and we moved him up to associate head coach, and he's flat out blossomed in that role. He has done a fabulous job helping my young staff. Even though they played for me, they're young. He's really done a good job mentoring them, teaching them, letting them, reminding them how we do things, um, and, and really gifted. He's, he's become a guy I really, really lean on. 
And it's 18 years. I mean, we've, we've been doing it. You know, it's funny. Everybody's kind of come and gone now in my program. I even lost Stephanie, my, my executive assistant, after our 17 years. Bolana still is here, but uh, he's really a, a key guy. Great insights. Um, the rhythm of our program knows how to knows how to deal with me some days and diffuse me. Um, but I'm I'm uh, I'm really uh, I'm really proud of who he's become, and he deserves to have a shot at a, a Division One job here, especially this spring. Coach, one thing that helped you propel you guys in the non-conference schedule last year was that preseason or not preseason, the tournament in Brooklyn. Sure. This year you're going out to Hawaii, maybe a little bit less of a familiar environment. What kind of challenge does that present? Well, it's an amazing challenge, you know, with you look at who's in that field with Michigan. You know, we got we got to beat Chaminade first. I mean, you know, they're going to play great. I mean, that game scares the heck out of me. They've gotten people before, and and uh, and and they'll play great against us in the Catholic State Championship of the island of Hawaii. Uh, uh, I think that can be referred to. Um, but you know, with that field, you could really gain a lot of confidence. And you could gain a lot of resume building out there. There's no question about it. Uh, it's a great trip. Last time we were there, they got to the championship game. Um, we played an unbelievable game against Texas in the semifinal. Lost to a great North Carolina team. Heron Goatee had pneumonia a little bit. That, that hurt us. But it, it was a great, you know, that was a real good building block for us. Um, it's a neat field, neat event, high-profile event. You really get to, you know, your program will be out there Thanksgiving week. But... Great challenge like some of our other non-league stuff. Coach, you talked about the NCAA stuff. Uh, there was a national poll in August where you were voted the second cleanest coach in the NCAA behind Beeline. So I'm not sure what he's doing better than you. <laughs> but uh, talk about what you speak with your young assistants yeah. as they're growing, the ethical behavior, the expectations sure. of this university, of this basketball program, and how you handle all of that. Well, I mean, there's no question. Our, right now, it's an embarrassing time for college basketball. Uh, I, I, I hope when we get the game started, we can get the focus back on it some. But let's be honest, um, the cleanup of the underbelly, the underworld of college basketball, you know, hasn't even begun yet, and it's going to take some time. Uh, there's no question that I'm confident in how we've run the program and philosophically – my young guys have kind of felt the philosophy, but I think during this time you're reminding them of how we do business here. Um, I do think big picture, um, and it's going to get. It's one of those things where you say it's going to get worse before it gets better. And being on the board of directors of the NABC, I do really feel we have a chance to attack this and fix some things in the basketball recruiting world that is that have always been you know, a little shady and, and, and a gray area and, and a not a gray area, quite frankly. So, you know, I, big picture, I think we can come out of this a little better. I love that Father John has been put on that commission. I think that's, uh, that's great. And, and I've been uh, talking to him a little bit, trying to educate him. This is very new to him, you know, the college basketball recruiting. Um, I hope he's not too scarred as I, as I talk to him about – you know, what goes on in our world. But I, I love that he'll be on the point of that. I think as as coaches, we have to be a big, big part of this too. We actually had a national call for the first time on Monday. All staffs and head coaches were on a national call with the NABC, Jim Haney, and kind of went through some things, reiterating, you know, doing things the right way, but also reiterating like, hey, we, we got some problems. But I think now that the FBI is involved, we do have a chance to fix it. The NCAA could, didn't have maybe enough teeth. Uh, so that, now, And it could be four years down the road. It could be a while. But I really do – we'll come out of it a little better. But we're going to bleed for a little bit right now. Do you dislike recruiting – the not recruiting specifically, but the whole environment of it worse today than you did 20 years ago? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think maybe it's gotten – um, it, it probably has gotten a little worse because there's more people around the prospect. You, I, I think 20 years ago, you were able to identify high school coach. You know, maybe there was a, there's more people around the prospect now, and so you know that can get a little exhausting and confusing at times. And you have to make sure you're talking to the right people that's going to help with the decision. Um, 
you know, I think through this um, rehab um, of the non-scholastic scene, you know, that's what we're going to try to attack. You know, f 15 years ago, we really tried to get these NCAA, USA Basketball, NABC-sponsored combines and clinics around the country. Uh, and we just never could really do it because the theme was unless the shoe companies unilaterally stand down, you know, we're not we're not going to be able to get it. Now, I think the thing that's going to be interesting is will the three shoe companies, after everything that they're going through, two of them obviously are already subpoenaed. Under Armour at this point has not been. Um, but are they going to say, I, I'm wondering, and I, 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 don't, I think they're still digesting, are, are those companies going to say, could you please take this off our hands? Because now we're getting into some stuff. For example, Adidas stock dropped nine points when that story broke. I mean, if you're the CEO of Adidas, are you going, wait a minute now, is this a good investment for us? I don't know that, you know, but, you know, I, if they stand down, then there's that vacuum again to reinvent it. We got to do something. And, and that's that's been a problem area. You know, I've said this many times when you guys have asked me about recruiting. I do miss not dealing with the high school coach as much as I used to. And then there's still cases, and we run into it a lot here, you know, because of the kind of young man we recruit, where you are dealing with the high school coach a lot. And you're going into the high school and you're talking to a guidance counselor and a principal and you're getting feedback from educators on what this young man is all about. I love that, and I think we all miss it. And I'm wondering if he can swing it back that way a little bit. Time will tell, but we got to do something because it is crisis mode right now. Mike, with Fonzie's progression, is there a moment you can kind of recall where things just started clicking for him and the way you sort of noticed him from the players? Well, I think where his teammates, uh, his freshman year at Georgia Tech, we go down to Atlanta, and uh, I, I left uh, uh, Zach August home because he had to handle an academic matter that he didn't handle. So I just left him home. And uh, so we go down there, and we decide to start Martin Gebbin. He's a big guy, so center in, big guy for a big guy. And he, he has a tough first half. And then we play Bonzi in the second half, and he's guarding their physical front line. He gets an elbow in the nose. He's bleeding. He's making putbacks. He's getting his hands on every loose ball. Flat out helps us get a road win down there. We haven't had many in Atlanta. And, and I think, you know, to watch Jaron, Pat, Demetrius, and all those guys just kind of go, my God, we need him. And for the head coach to go, what an idiot. You haven't had him in the game yet? And, and so I think that was the light bulb is on moment. He finished that year. You know, I remember back to the semifinals against Duke in the ACC uh, championship, ACC tournament. He's guarding Okafor. Again, he's getting elbows in the throat and the neck, and he's getting knocked down, and he's battling. And, but I think that was, you know what, we have a bright lights guy here, and the rest is kind of history. Um, Bonzi's been great on the boards, but as a team, it's been a while since you've had a great rebounding team. Do you see that changing? I still think that's an area we got to concentrate on. You know, I think we've been up and down in that area through 10 practices. One of the reasons Elijah Burns is very intriguing to me is how he is rebounding in traffic physically with two hands on both ends of the floor. Um, but I feel, still think that's an area. Now, I'll say this. Fluger and Gibbs, with their activity, even though they're not the biggest guys, they get their hands on a lot of long rebounds. That's an area where I think we're better, you know, our perimeter rebounding. Still, you know, we got to help out. I think for Martin Gebbin, he's always been a good offensive rebounder, not as good a defensive rebounder. He has been better on the defensive boards, but we got to stay on that. And, you know, that's why, again, I think Burns – Burns has really – I said he's easy to play with, but if there's one thing through 10 practices, he's the second leading rebounder through 10 practices behind Bonds. If there's one thing that stands out, it's been, oh, boy, he's going and getting that with two hands in traffic on the defensive end, and he's had some putbacks, and you go, oh, we're, we're going to need that. And so I think that's an area – you know, you know, finishing the defensive segment, the defensive rebound is part of finishing the defensive segment. I think we still need work on that. 
I'd probably ask about half a dozen players and Coach Humphrey, who's most likely to plant somebody on the floor during practice. <laughs> and it's unanimous that it's Burns. So he's, yeah. he's going to give you a physical presence. He gives us a great physical presence. And, and then, you know, he – He's really a smart basketball player. You know, we, we, we've recruited big guys that are good with the ball. He's really good with the ball. He knows how to get people open. He knows what a good shot is for him. He's not, you know, in the pecking order of getting a shot real early in the possession. But when he's got that open 15-footer and even an open three after some movement and end of clock, he's made those at a good clip. Um, again, his voice is amazing. It's one of the things I remember watching him down at Peach Jam, and he'd come out of a timeout, and he'd be reminding the point guard on the AAU team, by the way, now, when we run this, you're scr- he, he knew everybody's spot for a big guy. And so, you know, that, that kind of – that's really been attractive. But when the physicality of going up in traffic and rebounding with two hands, you go, okay, we're going to really need that. And that's why – I've been very excited about him through 10 practices. I, this might be something to talk about more in January when ACC play gets started, but I remember like last year after the ACC tournament, guys were obviously tired before hitting the NCAA tournament. With the difficulty of your schedule, is there anything you're doing now to, I don't know, get the guys not in better shape, but just keep them fresher throughout the season? Yeah, I think we've even, um, we're not even practicing very long now. You know, again, you've got one freshman. Jawan's a, a new guy, but his situation's a little bit different. He can get reps uh, away from the team stuff. Um, is, you know, like last night, we went an hour and 20. Now, we go a lot of five-on-five, five and there's some transitions, so it's a great workout. So I, I gave him a four-day weekend this past weekend. The weekend before, I gave him the weekend off. Um, shortening practices, changing up the routine. I always do that when we get to January. But we've even done that a little bit. You remember, October 15th used to be the start date. And I thought that was the sweet spot. You know, we started October, we started a little late. You could have started that Friday. We started that Monday, which was the third or the second, because I didn't want to, you know, but even that was a little early for this team. Next year's team, that's a little bit different story. But we've got some veteran guys that are going to log a lot of minutes. So. Um, just being really smart, I think we, uh, uh, in conjunction with our nutritionist and our strength coach, we have a pretty good recovery plan. You know, I bring Dr. Jerry Hoffworth in, who works with football as well. We call them recovery days, where we get the chiropractor in there and some massage therapists. So I'm, I'm really always uh, plugged into, and maybe more so earlier this year, because of the veteran nature of this group. Thanks, gang. Thank you, Mike.